Good afternoon, saints. Good afternoon. My desire this afternoon, and I trust the Spirit's desire, is to let the Word of God be alive in your hearts and in your souls today. Trust that the story that I'm about to read from the Word would not be just an abstract piece of literature from an ancient time, but that it really stir up your hearts and your soul and even cause an adjustment in the way we see and view God. Because after all, that's what the Word of God is all about. So that it guides us, it, it causes us to have a closer and even a better walk with Him. I'm going to turn to a very familiar story, a very familiar portion of Scripture. It's not a story, it was an actual historic event. And I just trust that the Spirit of God will bring the truth of His Word to our soul. Genesis chapter 22. Verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I, or here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Thank you. And we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. <laughs> Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I think a couple of weeks ago, Brother Garrett spoke on Jesus being the own son, only begotten son, and him being the well-beloved son. It was such a powerful message because of what those things are trying to say to us and really give us the extent of the greatness of the love of God. 
in one of the verses that he read, the familiar verse of John 3, 16, the love was stressed with the little word before it's so, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. But this story here, of, or this happening here with Abraham and Isaac is so powerful and found the foundational basis really of, I mean, Paul used Abraham as exhibit A in terms of justification by faith in Romans chapter 4 because Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But I do not want this morning to strip Abraham of his humanity because what we often do sometimes when we get to a portion of this is jump to the fact that Abraham was faithful and Abraham was his man of God and friend of God and would do anything that God said. All of that is true. But Abraham was a human. And we want to look, matter of fact, because of his humanity, elevated his faith. Because if he was this super spiritual, faithful giant, then the faith would not probably be as great as it was and was highlighted in the book of Hebrews 11 either. But because of the fact that he was a man and he had feelings and this was something that was asked of him that was going to pierce his soul, I want us to really examine this again from a different standpoint. But what we have in verse 1, he says, after these things, what things? What had happened before that caused the writer to say, after these things? Well, God had laid out the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham, right? And said, through your seed, you will have descendants as numerable as the stars in the sky. Abraham was a bit puzzled and said, I have no ear, but Eliezer, my servant. I am old. My wife is old. God said, you will have a son. I know what God did to mark that covenant in Genesis 15. He asked him to cut these animals up and create like a gauntlet, like a parallel tunnel. And right in there, it says that a flaming torch and a smoking oven just pass through the pieces, signifying the Shekinah glory of God. So what God did was consummate that covenant by his own person. I don't hear you here. When we make a covenant, sometimes we say, I swear by the life of my child, or I swear by this, and we go to the judge, I put up my right hand and swear to tell the truth. But there's no higher way or place or time to swear by but God himself. Amen. And when that assurance hit Abraham, he believed God. So he came home and told Sarah, his wife, Sarah wasn't really buying too much. And so she concocted a little scheme where she and Abraham was going to fulfill God's promise for him. And what she and Abraham did was allow her handmaid, who was Hagar, to go in unto Abraham. And they conceived and bore a son, Ishmael, who we know is the father of the Arab nation. See, when we step outside of the will and plan of God, sometimes problems do happen. Because the Arabs are like a thorn in the, in the eyes of the Israelis right now, aren't they? But that's what they did. And so Abraham go back to God and said, God, I have a son. God said, that's not the son I'm talking about. You and Sarah, your wife, is going to have a son. And it's through that son your seed and descendants will be established numerable as the stars in the sky. And Abraham came back home again and said to Hagar, I said to, to Sarah, you remember what I told you a couple of years ago? It's going to happen. You are going to have a son. And what did Sarah do? She laughed. <laughs> so, you know, I'm 90 years old. Have we seen any 90 years old around? Or 100 years old in Abraham's case? That's what God said was going to happen. So a little years pass and she conceived. And I would have liked to be a fly in the wall at that moment during those nine months when a 90 year old is pregnant. 
when a 90 year old is waiting to give birth and a 100 year old is just rubbing the hand on the abdomen of his wife 100 years old and 90 years imagine that for a moment Think about the humanity of it. Think about why would Sarah laugh? A 90-year-old? A 100-year-old? God said it. And he swore by his person that it was going to happen. And when Sarah gave birth to Isaac, the Bible didn't say this, but I believe it happened, that Abraham would have gone out of his tent and looked up in the sky. Because he remembered the promise of God. <clears throat> that was a miracle beyond miracle. So it's that context that we paint here. We have Genesis 22 after these things. So Abraham, no, you believe God, right? Because I swore by my name and it happened. You have Isaac, the son of promise. It's here. So do you believe? Yes, Lord, I do. Well, let me see. I want you to take your son. And I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. Is that what God said? That's not what God said. I deliberately misquote that verse, verse 2. God didn't say that. God said, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son who you love. See, I believe if God had said that, the first statement that I may take your son and offer him up, that said that Abraham would have gone to Ishmael's room and took Ishmael to offer him up. But God was specific in his command so that there's no ambiguity, there's no mistake. I want you to take your son. Well, it could be Ishmael. I want you to take the son who you love. It also could be Ishmael. But God finally said, it's Isaac, the son of promise. This is where I want the humanity coming, all of us right here. What? The son that you promised me, the son who you say the descendants and I have all these blessings through, you want me to kill him? What must have been going through Abraham's mind and heart. He's believing God. He's trusting God because he's a man of faith. But don't strip him of his humanity that he must have burdened and labored and wondered why. The son who I love. That's why the Bible stressed it. The one who you love. That's why his faith became so great. And many theologians say the reason why Abraham got up so early in the morning was because he was this giant of faith and he couldn't wait to do the will of God. Baloney! I believe he was restless through that night, thinking about what he was going to do to thrust that dagger through the heart of his son. And it must have pained him and he didn't want to wait because, you know, when you have to think about doing something like that, that's almost torture, isn't it? And yet it was a three days journey. He had a lot of time to think about. I'm going to kill the son of my heart's desire. But he's stepping out in obedience. And the Bible tells us that Abraham was a wealthy man, right? And he took, and he had many servants. He only took two. And he didn't order any of them to cut up the wood. He did that himself. A man who's over 100 years old. Why? Why? And he did not want anyone else to have anything to do with the death of his son. And he tells them, I want you to tarry here. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. I was reading a story recently about a man who had just moved into Pennsylvania. And the lady within the community, he was a prominent man, the lady within the community gave him two German shepherd dogs. The dogs were born on Palm Sunday, and because of that, they named the dogs Hallelujah and, um, and Hosanna. Hallelujah and Hosanna. They named the two dogs. The male one name was Hosanna. And the man said that he grew so affiliated with this dog. Everywhere he would go, the dog would be there. 
sitting where nice. And they would go hunting, the dog would go with him. And he said one day the dog went out in the woods and he got snake bitten. And he came home and two days after his head was swollen three times the actual size. And he took the dog to the vet. The vet said, I don't know if we can resuscitate this dog. We may have to put him to sleep. And he said he grew so upset because he had such an affiliation for his dog. But the doctor, the vet said, we'll try and do everything to preserve his life. And they did and they did. And he stayed there for about two weeks and get the medications and the injections. And he called the man one day and said, I think we could extend his life, but something has happened to him. Because of the medication, his whole face has been ruptured. He's living. But I'm going to give you a salve that you apply to it twice a day, and that skin structure will come back gradually. He got the news when he got the dog, came home with him, they gave him a glove, and he would apply the salve twice a day. And he said something happened the first time he was putting on the salve. He said he looked into the eyes of the dog, and the dog looked. It's like the dog was saying to him, I know this is uncomfortable for you. And I know because of the smell and everything that you don't really want to do this, but what you're doing is helping me. It's like he's getting that message from the dog. Then he said, as the days go by, the dog got ill and, and had a negative effect to what the original snake bite was. And then took him to the vet again and he had convulsions. It was one a day, then two or three, the doctor said, said to him, we have to put him to sleep. So he said he came home and he told his wife and his kids morning in the house. And because he was a hunter, he said, well, I don't want no one else to have anything to do with it. I'm going to take him out into the woods. I'm going to look through the eyes of the rifle and I'm going to shoot those eyes. And he said he looked at it there in the kennel, in the little bucket that he had. And he said he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. His wife asked him, said, who's going to do it? I said, could you just ask someone, maybe we can give another one. I can't do it. For two reasons, he said, because it was like a 10 minute drive to where they would probably go to shoot the dog. And he said, it would be torture for him in those 10 minutes to put his sick dog to sleep. A dog. And here you have Abraham who has a son who was young and vibrant and healthy, nothing at all wrong with him. He was a son of promise. And God said, I want to tear it down his heart. How do you think Abraham felt in that moment? How do you, from a humanitarian standpoint, but he trusts God. He believed God. And mind you, Abraham had his son of God, right? The very birth of his son. God was faithful to his promise. But Abraham stepped out in obedience, but being tortured inside. And Isaac said, Father, you notice something? He's seeing everything being prepared. Wood, altar, everything. But where's the lamb? Father, we're going to offer a burnt offering. You need a lamb for it, but I don't see any. Abraham's response was, my son, the Lord will provide himself a lamb for him. Did God do that? When our minds and our hearts are attuned to the things of God, we grow and see and find things out we otherwise would not. And Abraham stepped up there. And he went and he found Isaac. And I, I, I say, here's a hundred man who's a hundred over a hundred years old. And his son Isaac, a young, probably vibrant and strong, and allowed himself to be bound and put on that altar. But how did the Lord Jesus went to the cross? Did he resist? The scripture tells us that he was led as a, a lamb to the slaughter. She gone before. the torturous feeling of 
Abraham as he found Isaac on that altar. And the fire is lit up because the altar is in those days. You have to have fire underneath. So not only is he going to thrust that knife into the heart of his son, but he was going to roast his son. Do you imagine the emotional torture this man would have had to go through? But he's stepping out of the place. He was wondering. Put up his hand. And he's looking in his son's eyes, looking back at him. Just picture that for a moment, please. Take out spirituality for a moment. Think about the humanitarian aspect. He's lying here on the altar, looking in the eyes of his father with that dagger about to thrust in his heart. And as he was about to do that, he heard the voice, Abraham! Abraham. And he said, here am I. Where have you been? It's like he wanted to rescue him from doing the unimaginable. And God showed up and said, do nothing to Abraham, son. Because I know that you will not spare your son. Studying in our Bible study this week, that he who would not spare his own son shall he not freely give us all things. And that lamb that Abraham said that God will prepare, both of them turned around and look, and the ram was caught. Now, I could just imagine that conversation of Abraham and Isaac as they come back down from Mount Moriah. Bound, two minutes away from death. Wonder what that conversation was like. Mount Moriah. Where is it? Archaeologists told us that's what Jerusalem is. Mount Zion that we have in the scriptures. That's in essence what Mount Moriah was. Thousands of years later, the true Lamb of God was slain on that mountain. And the only difference was there was not a voice of rescue for this lamb. There was no voice saying, do not touch your son. When he cried, what happened? There was silence from heaven. When he said, Father, or my God, my God. No rescue. Isaac was, but Jesus wasn't. Hallelujah for that. That Jesus, God's lamb, the lamb that Abraham said, when John the Baptist saw him, John 1, 29, there he is. Here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that Lamb wasn't spared in your eyes. There was no substitute for that Lamb. He was that Lamb of God. And God put that proverbial knife and thrust it in the heart of his son. Because he on the cross must die. Could not save himself. Physically he could. But for love and for rescue, he couldn't. For salvation's plan, he couldn't. God's lamb was slain right on that mountain. What love! Oh God, to thee we owe that you give us your son and you did not withhold him and there was no substitute. You gave him for me. I want you to personalize it right now. That God gave his son for me. For me. Think about that. Think about the pain. Listen, what did he say about his son? At, 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 at baptism, we talked about it two weeks ago. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This son was the delight of the heart of the father. He was ever in his bosom. He said, Father, love the Son. And for filthy, wretched sinners as we were, 
God put that dagger in your heart of his son. For you, think about that for a moment. I think it's in Hebrews that said that if we fail to acknowledge his love, it's that we crucify him all over again. You want to know what love is? You look to the cross. In shining letters, God is love. That's what you see. Sure, you will see two hands and an out, and you will see a crown of thorns, and you will see a side pierced with a spear, and sure, you will see people staying afar back and stood beholding, and you will see that scene at Calvary. But what you see there, grandiosely, God is love. That's what you see. But all of that would be for naught if it doesn't have an impact on your heart. So Abraham stepped out. To do something that he thought would just rupture his heart, would give up the son of his love because he had experienced already the faithfulness of God. Dear ones, let me say, for God so loved that he gave his only son. The verse, I thank, I thank him that the verse didn't stop here. Sometimes we stop there at the verse. It says, That whosoever believes, so if you come believing, dead people will have life. Because right now, if you're in your sins, you're dead. The source of life is you. The Lord of life is you. The question is, what will you do? There was no cry from heaven to stop that death. Nothing. He on the cross was there. He would not spare his own son, but give him up for us. You know, I have my little daughter in here. My kids, I love them dearly, but some of them, the boys always say, You have a little something special for Rihanna. You know, and by the way, Rihanna knows it too. And she lets me know. And she has a little, little tap that she uses sometimes. She has two type of calls that she make to me. Like the 730 call is the call to say, okay, dad, how are you? How is your day? How is it going? The before 730 call is, um, my teacher said I need basketball shoes. <laughs> or I need this. And she doesn't, you can't ginola gino. I understand these things. I love them all. But if something was to happen to her, even physical, we're not talking about death now, God forbid. But if anything, and same thing with you and war parents, because can a woman tender care cease towards the child she bears? No. But God gave him up. Look at that. God give him up. Trust this great act of love will impact your heart in a way that when you come back and you meet here again, you'll say, I experienced the love of God because I have accepted Christ in my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. Will you do that today? Thank God. Will you do that today? I trust that you will for his name's sake. Amen.